We're back with Tony Wheeler. We are doing it in black and white. Uh, he's been incredibly patient with the troubleshooting, the technology sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. He's been a great sport. Thank you all for waiting. Of course, you all know who he is and how many of our travels have started. I've got my China aid mission that uh, started started my my travels as a foreign exchange student in China and uh, uh, got got me going on many countries all over the country in the world and we have him to thank for a lot of it and I think everybody of course wants to know from the Oracle what is the future of travel because you you, you started in 2020 with a uh, a post called assassinations climate change terrorism common sense so let's What's the common sense in the uh, COVID era? Look, who knows? I mean, we're, everybody is waiting to find out what happens. And um, I'm, I'm in Australia where we are locked down. We not only, not only can't travel overseas, we can't even travel between all states. There are some state borders are closed. We've got this discussion going on with the New Zealand government about opening a, a trans-Tasman travel bubble that we can travel between um, Australia and New Zealand. But I've got no idea what's going to happen. I, I think that there is going to be a situation of travel bubbles. That some countries accept people from other countries. Um, and, you know, countries um, they will accept visitors from, from other places they feel safe, they feel are safe or they'll be happy about going to places. The amusing one here from Australia at the moment is that Greece has just announced that um, they will accept visitors from an assortment of countries. Um, and that, that list includes Australia, but it does us absolutely no good at all because A, we can't leave Australia and B, there's no way of getting from Australia to Greece without going through a country that Greece does not accept. So they've... Um, they put up a, you know, a, a welcome, they put the welcome mat out, but the welcome mat doesn't work. And I think that's going to be the situation. I think there's going to be a, a bunch of countries where you they, they're simply, they're, their citizens are simply not wanted. I, I think Brazil is the, the most recent one that's popped up because their um, infection rate on a daily basis is very bad. And the USA has announced they don't want any Brazilians. But I think most countries wouldn't want any Americans. They'd look at the infection rate in America and say, and say, no, no, please stay away. When you when you've got your country sorted out, you can come visit us. Until then, we don't want to see you. It's a it's an yeah. interesting situation. I have an American passport, and I've long tried to remind myself how fortunate I am to have so many countries that are very easy to relatively easy access. And now I'm thinking it's not the greatest one to have in the next. Uh, 12, 18 months. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, as you say, 12 to 18 months, you know, other people have said six to nine months or three years to five years. We we have no idea what's going to happen on this. And I'm uh, I'm waiting to see. I really, I really am, I, I wish I, I, intrigued is not the right word because it's uh, it's made severe limitations on my life. Yeah, I saw the picture of you uh, at a Melbourne airport with the blank departures board uh, in your post. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, I went out to the airport when this is an airport generally, which is, you know, flat out flights coming and going constantly. It's a 24 hour airport, unlike Sydney Airport, mm -hmm. which has a nighttime curfew. But, you know, there I was middle of the day and nothing was happening at all. It was completely empty. I've never seen such a short line for security. Yeah, and I've I've actually got mixed feelings about Australian airports. I absolutely love the domestic terminals. It's it's like what people want to think the US experience was 30 years ago in terms of uh being genial and welcoming in that, but it also uh uh is I always wonder why do the terminal needs to be 3 miles away from the uh, the international terminal with uh I know there's a few exceptions, but like Sydney is yeah, quite Brisbane, quite a Brisbane, obviously flown into Brisbane, or Brisbane, Perth, and Sydney. Sydney also the international terminal is on the other side of the airport from domestic. Like it's history. I mean, I do quite a few airports. Heathrow in London, you know, there's terminals scattered all over the place. 
to train ride from one terminal to another. And uh, let's think positively, or at least where some of your travels might take you. You did quite a few posts uh, in the past uh, couple of years on different Australian islands. And I think because of the some of the country collecting or UNESCO connections, a lot of people in our group are familiar with Lord Howe Island, with Cocos Dealing, with Christmas. But you wrote about a number of different islands in Western Australia that that were new to me. So I'm curious, you mentioned Middle Island, Ray Church, Eris, Bass Strait. Some of these talk about when we're able to travel, which of these islands uh, you think we should make a beeline for? Well, actually those islands you're mentioning, uh, Lord Howe is um, part of Australia. Other, there's other islands which, you know, Cocos Keeling and Heard Island, Macquarie Island, um, um, Norfolk Island, which are, in some ways are either Australian territories or related, but they're not part of the, you know, the, the states of Australia. Pretty much like, you know, America, I, I think up to in America, the USA is going to be the last colonial nation. You're competing with France for how many colonies you're, you're going to have left at the, the end of time. Um, but the, the islands that you mentioned, the, the one that I was really impressed by was an island called Dirk Hartog, which is part of it's part of the state of Western Australia. It's only a kilometer or two off the coast, so it's no distance at all. But um, it, it's a four-wheel drive trip to get there. You can, get, you can get there on a light aircraft, a light aircraft or a four-wheel drive. And it's got a, it's an island with a lot of history. And I, I stayed there for a few days, and I, I was really impressed by it. I thought it was a, if you want a sort of outback experience island well that's an island to go to how about for an outback experience and the out, outback itself i think that's a, a term that, that many visitors to australia have a concept of but uh don't really know where to start yeah well they we we've got various definitions for it um back of burke is um is one burke is a town in new south wales sort of inland from sydney and when you get to burke you you're in the outback and back of Burke, beyond Burke, you're definitely in the outback. But there's a very easy way to tell if you're in the outback. When you're driving along the road and any car approaching you, the driver in the other car waves to you, then you know you're in the outback. You know, if you, you know you're really in the outback when a car coming the other way stops and you both get out of the car to have a discussion about what the road is like from where you come from. And then, then you're really in the outback but just waving to the other driver, well, that, that's a pretty, pretty definite sign that you're no longer in the, the inner reaches of civilization. And, and this is a full-on wave? This is not like the, the two-finger lift or finger lift in Norfolk Island? Uh, yeah, well, then you do sort of just, you know, raise your hand from the steering wheel. That's the very, the very casual wave. You know, you, you acknowledge the other person coming the other way. All right. And... Uh... I think there's a uh, often a debate, even on travel groups such as this, to to keep politics out of it. And uh, I feel like politics and and travel are inseparable. And uh, I've read Badlands. I've I've read Darklands. Uh, talk about how you how you think travelers like us that we'll assume we we like more open borders than closed. Uh, you know, and, and before the COVID stuff say my own country, the US, there were a lot of travel restrictions being put unilaterally on different countries. What, what are some ways you think for those of us that want to be politically engaged uh, in our countries to, to advocate for some of these values? Yeah, it's a, it, you know, the, the US is an interesting one. I, I was foreigners from, I'm sort of putting the apostrophes around it, civilized countries. Um, mm -hmm. uh, usually we can use a thing called an ESTA, electronic system for travel authority, I think it's called, or tourism authority. And you can apply for it online. It costs you $10 for four years or something. And, you know, once you've got an ESTA, you can just turn up at the, uh, the US immigration and you're, as much as you ever are waved through US immigration, waved through. Um, you've got to be basically from, you know, one of the um, European countries or Australia or Japan or, you know, the, the, the countries that the USA trusts, but then they otherwise need a visa. Uh, but, but also, if, if you have just visited certain countries, you're disqualified from having an ESTA. 
And I think that there's a five year time limit on it. And uh, I've been to a number of those. I've been to Sudan, I've been to Iran, um, you know, I've been to Yemen recently. You go to these countries and you're no longer valid for an ESTA. You have to go and get a visa. And the trouble is that this list uh, does change from time to time. And I've, I've had friends who, uh, I had a, a friend who's a filmmaker. He's got a, he's Australian based. He's got um, offices in one in Hollywood and one in, um, one in London. And he was at his London office recently and then was planning to fly to the US office and then fly on back to Australia. And suddenly North Korea had been added to the ESTA disqualification list. And he'd been to North Korea, and he only mm. discovered this when he got to the airport in London, and um, <laughs> they wouldn't afford the flight. So he wow. ended up cancelling his US trip and going straight back to Australia. And I, I've had an amusing contact from um, some a, a woman who, I think she's German, who's currently stuck on the island of Tonga. And Tonga doesn't have any coronavirus at all. They haven't had a single case. So it's a good, safe place to... Um, to be stuck, but she wanted to go home to Germany. And, you know, there's very few flights at the moment, and there was a flight that would take her back to Germany via the States, but she'd also been to North Korea. So she was disqualified from doing that, and she couldn't get a US visa in Tonga at the moment. Uh, the mm. other alternative was to go home to Germany via New Zealand. And um, New Zealand, if you were more than a certain number of hours in transit, then you were subject to 14 days quarantine and going home by New Zealand, she exceeded this um, transit time and therefore she couldn't use New Zealand either. So currently wow. she's stuck in Tonga. Oh Interesting. <laughs> Speaking of stuck, you were, you were almost stuck in, in Yemen. So talk about Sakodra. I had the good fortune to visit a year ago, and uh, uh, you and uh, some I think Ted Nims is watching, we're, we're in that group that was rushed rushed out in March. Yeah, we were on the island of Socotra, which is, um, you know, it's, it's part of Yemen, but it's separate from the Yemen mainland. And it's on the mainland where the trouble is in Yemen, the civil wars going on, the Saudis are raining down their smart bombs on any school or wedding they can find. Um, Socotra, though, is quite okay. It's been described as the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean although it's um, vegetation rather than animal life that gives it that, that title. And I was on a group that, as you may say, included Ted Nims, who, who went to um, Socotra for a week. And um, unfortunately in March, this was just when the world started to shut down and that they were closing down all flights out, into and out of Yemen. So we had to, we, we were there for, for seven days was our plan. So it was only one flight a week. So yeah, you came in on, I think it was Wednesday, and you left on Wednesday. But then suddenly the, everything was shutting down and the, the Wednesday flight was brought forward to Monday and we had to leave the country in rather a hurry two days earlier than we planned, which was a, a great shame. And, and talk about a bit about, about the experience. It uh, must, must visit for anybody that can, medium. Uh, wh where do you rank it having seen so many places? Well, I, I've, you know, Yemen, it's funny, Yemen is the only country in that region of the world that I've not been to. So I, I've been to all the other Gulf states and Saudi Arabia and Oman and so on. But Yemen I've not been to. And it was one that's been on my want to visit with many people. And I, I think a lot of it is the, the, the mud skyscraper architecture. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sana'a, the, um, the capital. And of course, Sana'a is the, the center of where it's, a no-go zone at the moment. So Yemen is a, a place that's on many people's bucket list and unfortunately a place that many of us have not gone to. And Socotra, you know, it's, it was definitely part of Yemen. So if anyone said, have you been to Yemen? Yeah, I have, but I've not been to the part of Yemen that I really wanted to visit. Although I was, you know, I want to visit Socotra as well. So Socotra was definitely worth seeing. And we've got a question from Ryan. So he's asking, uh, let's see, uh, you've been traveling for a long time. What's a big change that you've seen that's good? And what's a big change that you've seen that's negative? Well, right now, right now, the fact that I can't travel anywhere. 
<laughs> Look, I, I, I think there's, um, you know, there's, a, there's positives in the world and places open and close. I, I think the two countries I can think of that, you know, for many years I wanted to go to them and for many years I was unable to go to them and then the, then the doors did open. One was Ethiopia. You know, there was 10 years or more when Ethiopia was really closed off to the outside world because of its hor horrible government. Um, the government was overthrown and Ethiopia, Ethiopia opened its doors and now it's a, a major destination. And, you know, Ethiopia, I was very pleased to go there when I was able to, and I've not been back. I had been back to Eritrea, I had been to Eritrea in recent years, which at one time was part of Ethiopia. Um, and the other one that I, for many years, was you didn't go there unless you were, were very brave or very foolish, was Lebanon. Uh, and again, mm. when Lebanon opened up, I, I went there. And again, I haven't been back to Lebanon subsequently, but you know, it was a very interesting country to visit. And it's been very much up and down since that occasion I visited it. And of course, right now, like everywhere else in the world, it's totally closed off. So yeah, there are places that open and close. And you know, there are places right now which are closed. You know, Yemen's an example. That Yemen's been open and closed and open and closed over the years. And quite apart from coronavirus, Yemen is pretty much has been pretty much closed in recent years. Um, the the annoy nobody likes going through security and messing around. Although I often say that you know, but before before 9/11. You could never do it in the USA, US flights, but other airlines around the world. If you politely asked, I'd like to go up to the flight deck and, you know, look over the, the pilots and the co-pilots' shoulder, a mm -hmm. lot of airlines would invite you up. And that was a, one of the pleasures of flying, I thought. You know, sometimes I remember only a few months before 9-11, um, airlines had started flying over Afghanistan. For many years, they skirted around Afghanistan. They went north or they went south of it. And um, when they started flying over Afghanistan on a couple of flights, I, um, I asked one of the flight attendants, I said, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan at ground level. I'd really like to see it from above. Would you ask the flight deck if I can come up and have a look? And sure enough, you know, they, the invitation came back and I went up there and sat and chatted with the, um, the captain and the first officer, the pilot and co-pilot, and looked out over Afghanistan as we flew across it. Um, on one occasion, subsequently getting an a invite to um, sit on the flight deck as we came into Bangkok. You know, how often does that happen? You're in a 747 <laughs> sitting there, you know, watching the landing. That's, that's, a, that's a, a pleasure which, you know, now is totally denied to us. All right. And Layla's asking for a travel experience in your youth that had a, uh, a big impact on you. So before before even Southeast Asia on a shoestring, really youth. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I, I, I was lucky to travel when I was very young because my, my father was in the airline business and you know, I lived in different countries because of where he was working. Um, but I, I don't think that travel is really travel until you Yeah, I'm just I'm, the, the image. I couldn't get it fixed. It's making a flash, so I think they can still hear you. We'll just switch to this. Yeah, I'm traveling. Uh -huh. We've got a. They they said we have to have you. Uh, we have to have you on on the the black and white. So uh, sorry about this. I'm trying every every alternative to make it work, but uh, I have no idea why it's flashing at all. It wasn't flashing for a while there. But... Yeah, it was um, something when it moved around. It's the, the camera is doing this IR thing that uh, it's picking the light. So I, 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 I don't, uh, I don't know if we kick you out and try one more time. But uh, yeah, yeah uh, it no, it doesn't help. Somehow the uh, the the camera is thinking it's an IR mode, and and uh, yeah, for everybody watching, we we tried gamely to uh, troubleshoot before, and it uh, every so often the computer defies the, the troubleshooting efforts so, yeah um, yeah i have no idea what it's about i'll move into another room yeah I, or, or I, I could just kick you out for a moment and i'll just try to have you try the link one more time and see if uh yeah. somehow yeah, right now it's, yeah. <laughs> that, that so you see what, a, what a great sport he is putting up with all of the uh all of this uh, uh <laughs> i'm going into a room that's probably dark. 
The, the one I really wanted to have go perfectly is the one we've had the most technical issues, of course. So, <laughs> so. yeah, no, no, that's not working either. I've got, I've got no yeah. idea what's happening. Yeah, you can just point it away from you, and then it shouldn't flash because I think the moving is what does it. So just okay, away. yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. But um, we've got the picture, and we'll do our best. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Really appreciate your your fight through this. So, um, one one thing I wanted to ask you is uh, uh, one of the greatest features I felt about the the Lonely Planet uh, guides when when you were involved and, and prior to BBC and all that is is the maps. And I'm curious the story. I, I still uh, a few years ago I got the 2008 edition of Micronesia just to have the maps for uh, finding World War II sites in in uh, Tarawa and uh, different things. And I find the maps incredibly useful. And, and uh, so I'm curious about the genesis of those and, and the, my regrets that the maps have been redesigned to the point that I can't use very well. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, maps are curious things. I, I always loved the maps as well. And I, they were one of the things I really enjoyed about it. And I know lots of the Lonely Planet writers were great cartographic enthusiasts. and really enjoyed um, putting those maps together and finding the base material you could use for it. And of course, nowadays we feel that with, you know, Google Earth, everything on Earth is mapped and, um, you know, it's, it's no problem at all. But I, I, I'm a, a, you know, the, the real story at the end is to, to do a good map, you have to see it at ground level. You cannot do it from a satellite. A satellite may have it, you know, technically there, but you, you need to know the names of the places. And the only way you can find the name of a place and really know what's there is down at ground level. So uh, it does, really good maps really require real travel. They, they require boots on the ground. And you're, you're never going to get that from a, purely from a website or purely from a satellite. It, it requires real travel. Who owns the rights to the pre-BBC maps? I've, I've wondered if I could have a way to license the, the old maps and, and figure out how to update them and, and, and sell those for, yeah. for people. Who work. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, one of the things about um, Lonely, I mean, I've, I've been out of Lonely Planet now for 10 years, so it's not my, it's not my baby to worry about. And of course it's going through great upheavals at the moment because if people aren't flying anywhere, they're, they're not buying guidebooks either. So, you know, travel at the moment is a, is a real, real problem. Um, or, Travel guidebook publishing is a real, real problem. But I, I often said at Lonely Planet, they could have put those some of those old guidebooks not back into print, but make them digitally available, and uh, you know put a high enough price on them that um, it would be a, a profitable operation. But there were lots of guidebooks that just were not available anymore. You know that that, that material just wasn't out there anymore, and it would be great to be able to be able to use it in some form. I, I think of places in Africa that, you know, once upon a time you could travel around and the Congo is a good example. I, I went to the Congo the Democratic Republic, not Congo Brazzaville, um, Democratic Republic a few years ago. And it was a really, really interesting country to travel around, but you could travel around a lot more of it 20 or 30 years ago than you can at the moment. So uh, if you went back to those 30 year old guidebooks, you'd find a lot of material which you know isn't there today because places are not they're not travelable. Yeah, I think a lot of us in the group are are still finding ways to uh, <laughs> to, to to make them travelable as as hard as it is uh, uh, and that's oh, yeah. uh, I I think the Congo is a really good example of that because you know you do get film or writing from people who've been tra traveling in the Congo and they they're always right out there. I'm just really impressed with the the places they get to and the, the trips they do and you know if I had a, another lifetime there's some more Congo travel I'd do when I was there I, I spoke with some people about getting a boat and taking a boat down the river from um, Kisangani down to Kinshasa the trip would take a few weeks and I, I had a few friends who sort of signed up and said, yeah, they'd go on it. And we, we never did it. But, you know, the, the thought was there. And I think that would be a, a great trip to do. 
What what is your uh, what what are the wish lists that that you're still looking ahead for? Oh, I've got loads of them because I I'm not you know there are the the um, every country people who get their travelers century list and you know expand it to go to every country in the United Nations and then having arcane arguments about places that aren't in the United Nations but Taiwan the the, the obvious first example but nevertheless are real countries. Um, and I've, I've never done that. I haven't sort of gone out and thought, well, I'm going to take a box. Uh, and the, no question, I have been to a lot of countries, but I've never set out to go to every country on earth. Um, so there's lots of places I haven't been to. And I was just about to go to two Latin American countries, which I'd never visited. And um, I'm still ticketed to go to them, but the, um, the flights have come and gone because the flights were canceled. I was going to Paraguay and Uruguay. So, you know, when, when the doors reopen, they, they might be the first, first two places I go to. Fantastic. And uh, Michael's asking uh, uh, the, the task of writing a guidebook. He says, it seems like it would take many years to write, but you and your co-authors figured out how to quickly capture major uh, sites, hotels, restaurants, transport, et cetera, and to do it uh, before widespread use of the internet or even the existence of the internet. So what, that process of information gathering, uh, even for people who nowadays don't want to be online, talk about the methods. Well, it, it was, I, I said boots on the ground, and that's really what it was. It was a question of um, of going out there and traveling. And the, you know, the early guidebooks the early guidebooks weren't researched as extensively as they guidebooks were later on, but from the very the very start, it was a question of going out there and walking door to door, and you know that with uh, I don't want to say even to the end with Lonely Planet because I hope Lonely Planet hasn't ended. It's just in a period of hiatus at the moment, but um, you know it, it, it's still a question of going out there. I don't, you know, the internet's wonderful and I use it all the time, but I don't believe it fully. Just because you go on online, you find a website and it tells you about what the opening hours are, it doesn't mean anything at all. You can find those opening hours online and you can go to the place and find out, discover that it closed down last year. Um, so you, you, can't, you can't trust the internet. You, again, it's boots on the ground if you really want to find out what the story is. Fantastic. And James is asking your most interesting travel experience. So you get you get to tell the bar story that that you you that you've tired everybody else with, but we haven't heard. <laughs> oh, look, I, 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 you know, there's there's constantly. I think one of the things when you when you're young, when you're young and you do a big trip, I think big trips always have a big impact. And my first, you know, I, I traveled around Europe a bit and. In here and there but my first big trip was doing the asia overland trip and starting out in london and eventually getting to Kathmandu and then carrying on down through southeast asia and ending up in australia and that was a big trip and i i think trips that last you know six months or a year they're, they're big trips and they're trips you never forget particularly if you do them when you're young but you know i i've had i've had great trips in recent years some of them quite short i mentioned earlier in our talk about going to this island off the coast of Western Australia, Dirk Hartog. And that was only a few days, but it was a great trip, a wonderful trip. Um, I did a, with some bunch of friends um, here in Australia, did a the bunch of friends were from all over the place. They were from the United States, they were from Europe. Um, and we, we, we chartered a small aircraft. There were 10 of us on the plane and we, we flew across the north of Australia going into places where you could only get to by plane or plane or by boat. And there was only a boat once a year. So really it required a plane to get there. And again, that was a, a fabulous trip. You know, we all got out of it and thought you know, at the end, you know, well, that was one of the best trips we've ever done. So there, there are trips that, you know, yeah, who, who, can, who can say? I, I joined a few years ago, there's an annual bicycle ride, um, which goes, it starts in, um, in Cairo and it ends up four months later in Cape Town and I, I didn't do the whole thing I only did two weeks of it we had a Lonely Planet team doing it as a sort of a relay and I did the um, two weeks through um, through Tanzania and Malawi um, and, and I if I had four months I would have loved to have done that whole trip 
everybody who did it, you know, just it was great, one of the great experiences of their lives. And I know all the Lonely Planet people who did two week parts of it. We all compared notes and we all enjoyed it. We all would have liked to have some, some of them did do more of it. Some of them stayed on and turned two weeks into four weeks. And I would like to be one of those people. I would like to be one who did the whole four months. Well, there's a trip that, you know, if you, you want to do it, you can't do it this year, of course, but hope you're back online and you can do that trip. Tour d'Afrique, it's called. Ah, and so Kevin is asking, let's see, uh, had you been in charge instead of selling to BBC, what would you have done differently on the guidebook business end? Uh, he's saying he teaches management and innovative industries for a living, so he's... Uh, wondering your thoughts on that so you didn't sell no, to bbc no. you were still running it what would be what would you yeah, have done like, I, like I, as of today i'm really glad i'm not running it because you know it's it's not a it's not a good situation to be in at all i don't know i mean the, the bbc turned out not to have been the um the the best possible purchaser of lonely planet but you know they didn't they didn't wreck it um and you know it, it's still i hope it'll come back after coronavirus but, but you know it's a different world from when i started lonely planet to when we sold lonely planet the world had changed and i i can't say that you know somebody else did the wrong thing because you know i i wasn't there to do do anything anyway so things had to change you you couldn't go on selling paper paper guidebooks you could keep on selling paper guidebooks but it couldn't be the core of the business in a digital world so things had to change with lonely planet and i i still you know if i'd gone off in march this year to um paraguay and uruguay as i intended i would have been using the lonely planet guidebook to find my way around and i would have enjoyed it i would have found it really useful i would have really it, it would have been a great trip um so you know they still they still definitely have their use and you know, hopefully when I come out of this, when we all come out of this, I'll be back to using those guidebooks again. Yeah, I, I absolutely still use guidebooks. I, I, I love the systematic view of a place that and that's partly why I get the, the much older edition Lonely Planets where they have essentially full coverage of the, the geographic spread of a country and not the, the selectiveness. There, there's a comment now about uh, travel planning by Instagram. Have you are you an Instagram user? And have you tried planning any travels by Instagram? No, I, no. you know, I, I am a, I'm a Luddite. I, I just, you know, I, I'm deeply distrustful of Facebook. I see the enormous amount of damage they've done in countries in the world. And I, I really would like Mr. Zuckerberg to go in, put a few billion dollars into correcting some of the, the huge damage that Facebook has done. He could go to he could go to Bangladesh to start with and think, you know, well, I, I Facebook, you know, was a, a major influence in, you know, getting people kicked out of out of Burma, Myanmar, and now living in this horrific refugee camp, which I visited. I've been to that Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh, you know, and if um, if if uh, Mark Zuckerberg was to put a few hundred million into writing that wrong. I would have a huge amount more respect for him. Meanwhile, I won't touch Facebook with a 10 foot pole. I, I'm not on Facebook. I will not get anywhere near Facebook. And I'm deeply distrustful of a lot of social media. So, you know, I, I think Instagram's a lot of fun. And I've, um, I've been to where the, the thing that you and I first met at, you know, I, I went along to an Instagram um, session on that. And there was a, a well known Instagrammer who was in, um, on, the island of Socotra when I was there and Ted Nims was there. Um, so yeah, you know, it's very interesting, but, but as, as a tool for me for directing my travel, no, I don't use it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, my, my concerns about it are that uh, uh, the, the more, the more selective social media algorithms are feeding you stuff, the, the more likely you're, you're, you're not to discover something that that uh, have been some of the great highlights of my trips by taking that broad sweep and not not lettering it letting it filter down to the the one place that everybody wants to uh, take a picture. Yeah, get yeah, that. No, I've, I've got I I uh, yeah Instagram. There we go. I keep keep getting told I should use it, and I probably should, but 
Uh, I, I feel that way. My, my policy is to wait at least three years to hope a social media platform dies. And if it hasn't died and people are still using it, I might have to learn it there. But uh, a, a lot of our members are lamenting the loss of Thorn Tree Forum, which was just recently closed yeah. down. At, uh, oh, look at that, God. Yeah, there that, you go. But speaking of the conference, so that your, your reference, we met at the TravelCon conference in Boston last year that Nomadic Map put together. So you you studiously attended a bunch of sessions. I was honored that you popped into the, the one I was involved with, with frequent flyer programs. But talk about what you learned, what what you saw as potential opportunities for, for the young people listening that are looking at some kind of entrepreneurship, blogging, travel information, travel agency, any that interest to get into the industry in some way. Well, I, I think that would probably be a very good thing to do. I. I, you know, I, I did drop into the frequent flyer one and, you know, I accumulate lots of frequent flyer miles and <laughs> not using them at the moment, but, you know, I, I do, I am a user of frequent flyer miles. So I, I found that, that session really interesting. I, I found the Instagrammer session really interesting because it was really something that I didn't know about. And I, I told people afterwards that I, I, found, I thought it was very similar in lots of ways to lots of... Um, travel writing um, uh, conferences I'd been to in the past. And th those travel writing conferences were very much aimed at guidebook writers and travel, travel literature writers and magazine contributors and you know, all that field of travel writing. Well, you know, that, that, that session, the, the one in Boston that we both went to, because, you know, that's sort of thing, but not for travel writing. Travel writing appeared in it, of course, but, but much more for the, the digital world. And really today, you know, if you're going to go into um, looking for a, a life in travel in that respect, you know, you, sh you should be looking at, you can look at both. You can look at travel writing and the digital world, but probably the digital world is where you should be paying your first or your major attention. And the style of writing, communicating print versus digital, is there, is, is there a, a master tip you have for effectively, if, if you are somebody that's been used to writing in print, to, to being better online? No, I, I, no I, I don't think there is. I think they're both very valid forms of communication. And I, I think the thing I, two things you, we, everybody says on this, you know, is you can go to the most interesting place in the world and, you know, you can still write about it in a truly boring fashion, or you can still take truly boring photographs. So just because the place is interesting doesn't mean what you have to say about it um, necessarily be interesting. Um, and equally, you can go to somewhere very boring and make a really interesting story about it or take really interesting photographs or, or video or whatever else. But it, it does, you know, you, you are a jump ahead if you're going somewhere that people don't know about. If you go somewhere that's more unusual, you know, you, you are a, a step ahead of somebody who's going to, oh, another thing on Italy. You know, Italy's wonderful. I, I love going to Italy. I, I was there last year and went to places in Italy I'd never been to before and really enjoyed and enjoyed putting them on my blog, you know, the, uh, the town of Ravenna. I remember you highlighted and I've, I've yeah. been to those and ran out of time on a trip. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'd been to, you know, I'd been close to it before, and last year I finally got there, and I was, I was blown away by it. I thought, why have I been to Italy so many times, and never been to this particular town, which was so enjoyable. But on the other hand, you know, lots and lots of people are going to Italy and writing about, or filming, or videoing, or photographing, or whatever else, Ravenna. Whereas if you go to Socotra, you haven't got so much competition. Although I'd, I'd almost challenge and, and think about that in terms of the the online model of uh, people are searching for Italy and the, the really f successful and commercial sense blogs and, and and websites are the ones that are focused for for people that are already know what they're looking for and, and a lot of us in the group are the type to go to these unusual places and it, it seems hard to get that in front of people in the way that Google and, and the other networks uh, pick up in, yeah. in terms of nobody knows to be searching for Socotra except except the handful of us. Well, isn't that great? I, that's that's wonderful. You know, it's uh, I think that definitely makes life more interesting that um, 
that people look for the more unusual things. They don't all just follow the beaten track, beaten path. Fantastic. And uh, just running through the questions. So we've got so many compliments that I've I've been ignoring about uh, how how you got they got started traveling and and how much uh, some of the the uh, books. I guess there's a five dollar reprint of uh, your earliest works that that came out. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, well, that's totally out of date. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, when, when there, there was um, an Australian travel writer. It's probably ten years ago now who um, decided he was going to follow, go around Southeast Asia using our original Southeast Asia guide. So it was, uh, I think he did this, probably if, I, if it was 10 years ago, the book would have been 30 years out of date rather than 40 years out of date. Mm. And, you know, he, he, he went to, whichever place he went to, he tried to find places that, and some, many of them were still there. It was remarkable how many places 30 years later were still there and you could still go to this place and, eat in that restaurant. And I thought it was a really interesting project. I, I spent a day with him, following mm. him around, seeing what, you know, what happened to him on this, following my 30 year old footsteps. That's a kind of interesting thing to do. I, you know, I've seen a similar thing with people using Arthur Fromer's, um, you know, Europe on $10 a day, oh, yeah. and trying, to, trying to stay in the, the hotels that in Paris were $10 a day in 19, 54 or 55 or whatever and if they still exist today they're 200 dollars a day but you know remarkably some of them are still there and that's that's really that's an interesting project i think yeah that's fantastic and as i said i i all of my lonely planets are pre-bbc so we'll just wait a decade or two and i'll, I'll be <laughs> doing the same thing around the world <laughs> yeah uh, question from ryan he says uh what's a place you went to and thought why is this so popular underwhelming spots <laughs> oh i don't know that i've i've not i've never been anywhere i haven't found interesting in in some fashion you know and there's lots of you know i i remember going to um when when my kids were small i i did i wonder if i went to disneyland before i had children i might have done but certainly when my i had small children i went to disneyland we went to all of them we went we when we were we lived in paris for a year and we took them to Disney Paris, and we were going through Japan once. We went to pa pa the um, Tokyo Disneyland, and I, I'm pretty sure we might have been there. One in Hong Kong we might have been there, if there is one. Um, you know, we, we, and of course we went to the one in Anaheim. Um, I've never been to Florida, the Florida Disney. I've been to Florida a few times, but I've avoided Disney there. But you know, that's that's a place which I I, I wouldn't feel feel any need to go to now, unless it was purely out of um, making a joke about it or nostalgia or something, or with small kids. I, I've heard that Tokyo Disney Sea is quite the experience, that uh, it's <laughs> entirely Japanese designed and they've taken Disney to a whole new level. So that, well, that one right. has my curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> and I think we'll close with uh, Matthew. He's, he's saying the the uh, LP television series in the late 90s was inspirational to my travel. And of course, the books, I would have been lost without my book in India in 98. And he's uh, he's one of those like me, every country in the world, travelers. And you've, you, you've yeah, been. Well, I, was, I was just directed to the, the Lonely Planet website, which has a, a thing at the moment about um, watching all their um, television and video, digital production, well, television and video productions. But amazingly, it doesn't feature the, um, the, the the Lonely Planet television that was produced in an era when Lonely Planet had its own television department. And mm. I think that's because a lot of them were done in combination with things like National Geographic. And as a result, Lonely Planet doesn't have the sole rights to them that National Geographic. So you can go on Lonely Planet, um, the Lonely Planet website and look for Lonely Planet television but you won't find the really, uh, the really, the real Lonely Planet television. And I did a few. I did an Alaska one with them. I did a, um, a Laos one with them. And um, you, you won't find those on the, um, on the LP website, unfortunately. Maybe we could have a, a film festival that you host of those when we're all able to travel again. <laughs> yeah, who knows? They'd be, they'd be, we'd get them out in some fashion, I'm sure. It'd be fun to do.
nostalgia. Right. Thank, thank you for joining us and thank you for putting up with all the technical issues. This is our yeah, 80th sorry, episode of the one I really wanted to have totally smooth technology and it's the one that, that unfortunately caused the most hassle for the guests. So thank you. Can't be helped. Good to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.